Well, welcome and thank you for being with us. If you are watching on the McConnell Center's YouTube channel or you're listening to the podcast, uh, we appreciate you being here and being with us as we think through variety of political thoughts left and right this year here at the McConnell Center. And of course, we're in a period now in this project where we are exploring the very foundations, arguably, of left and right uh, thinking and looking at Edmund Burke's Reflections on the Revolution in France and Thomas Paine's uh, The Rights of Man, which is a reaction in lots of ways um, to, um, uh, to Edmund Burke. We appreciate you being here with us today to start a conversation about Thomas Paine. And we have with us today David Benner. David is an amateur historian who focuses on the antebellum period of American history and particularly the American political founding. He's a contributor to the Tenth Amendment Center and the Ludwig von Mises Institute. He's the author of three books including the reason he is here today, Thomas Paine, A Lifetime of Radicalism. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome David Benner. All right. Yeah, thank you all for having me. This is such an incredible opportunity and great gift. I thank Professor Gregg and the university for having me. I know that you all have been going down kind of the rabbit hole of classic political thought when it came to Burke and he told me you also studied Machiavelli and some others, so um, my goal today is to make you believe that Edmund Burke is a total scoundrel, he had nothing to offer the world, and only Thomas Paine did. No, I'm, I'm just, I'm kind of kidding about that. I like Burke. There's lots of redeemable features of Burke, but in many ways, Professor Gregg was right, especially when it came to the French Revolution. Paine was, in many ways, a reactionary to what Burke was saying. But there's so much more to Payne than that. Um, in fact, if you were to put Payne's life into a movie, people would say there's no way that this could be conceivable. In so many ways. Um, he was a total villain to his adversaries, a very good friend to his closest followers. Um, he didn't share the same founding story like people like Jefferson and Washington did. He wasn't a landed aristocrat that had inherited so much wealth and had, you know, been placed at the top of the economic classes of that time. He was a tradesman that came from a poor middle-class family in Lewis, England. Um, in many ways, he, he was never supposed to be the banner waver of American independence, but yet that's how many of us know him today. But that's just a small fraction of who Paine was. Um, if you were a European, you would know him as the author of The Rights of Man, probably the most important political treatise on classical liberalism in the entire world, still today. Yeah. Part two sold over a million copies in his time, which was absolutely unheard of. Um, religious skeptics and deists looked to him as being kind of the father of modern atheism in some ways. He was a total religious skeptic who believed in a clockmaker creator, but had nothing but disdain for organized religious institutions. Um, he was so much more than that. So today I wanted to kind of do a gallop through his life and kind of articulate the pain who no one knows. And you know, some of these things will be definitely tangentially related to his writings and some of the ideas that you guys are studying. So um, I hope that, you know, all of it is germane in the grand scheme of things. I think it will be. Um, one thing that I wanted to say about pain before we continue is in the vein of what I said earlier about people would not believe that his life unfolded the way it does, even if it were made into a movie, is because he suffered seven close calls with death while he was alive. Um, I articulate all of those in the book, but we'll touch on some today, one of which is related to the French Revolution, actually two of which are. Um, but there's so many things to pain that could have led to an untimely death. He rocked the political establishments of three countries. The United States, France, and Britain. Um, he, his words served as the catalyst for two great revolutions on the world stage. And in all three of those countries that he rocked the political establishments of, two of them uh, almost put him to death, <laughs> so to speak. So, I mean, I just think it's an incredible story of his life. So let's just start more or less chronologically and just build into the French Revolution. So Thomas Paine, the tax collector, 
Um, can I see a show of hands here? Does it, did anyone know prior to this class that Thomas Paine was once a tax collector? Well, he was, and that's perhaps one of the biggest ironies because in many ways, you know, the American Revolution is portrayed as, at least in some way, as a tax revolt. And I don't think that actually conceptualizes it perfect, but nonetheless, that's true. Um, and Thomas Paine was employed by King George III, the king that he decried as a tyrant. Um, and it's so interesting. Like I said earlier, he was born as a tradesman to a middle lower class family in Lewis. His father was a corset maker, an artisan who made um, actually the underpinnings of corsets. They were called stays. He was a stay maker. Um, those stays would be put into the structural underpinnings of a woman's corset. And that's, you know, Payne's family trade. Uh, Payne tried to pursue that for a time, but it didn't really work out too well. So he indulged in several other professions, one of which he was a privateer. He s sailed on privately owned ships during the Seven Years' War, which our theater here was called the French and Indian War, um, looting the ships of France, the country he ironically would once help nurture, on behalf of Britain, the government that he condemned as tyrannical. So um, that was one profession, but as a tax collector, after being a privateer, he moved into tax collecting. He became an exciseman in Alford and Lewis, England. And what these tax collectors would do, the excisemen, would, they would, they would uh, live along the ports of England's harbors um, and basically make sure that um, the inspected cargoes of ships that came in matched the same amount of money, that the money was aligned to the amount of cargo that these ships had. Um, it was a grueling job with bad working conditions. Um, also, it was kind of, uh, p it was primed for violent outbursts at times, especially when it came to the advent of alcoholic gin, which was smuggled along the, the coast of England um, at the time. Um, but he didn't, he didn't love his profession too much, but he did try to start a family. Um, ironically, that is where he got his his work with the pen started. That is where he became a writer. And you wouldn't think necessarily, why would this tax collector become a writer through that? Well, what happened was in 1772, many of his fellow excisemen kind of got together and decided, hey, these working conditions are pitiful. It's hard to raise a family. Um, we're not making enough money. Our standing is kind of meager compared to many of our peers, so we want to actually articulate our grievances to English Parliament. Well, none of them felt fit to write, write to do this, to write a petition to Parliament, so for whatever reason, and we're not quite sure why, they turned to Payne. They said, hey, this guy's going to do it. And it's so crazy to think that that was his start, but he did. His first pamphlet was called The Case of the Officers of Excise, and it was just an official list of grievances that he had given to Parliament. Um, that petition fell completely on deaf ears. Parliament completely ignored it. None of the excisemen's uh, grievances were addressed at all. And really that is the impetus for him, I think in some ways, to travel to America. He was sponsored by Benjamin Franklin in a way. Franklin wrote him a note of recommendation and these notes were kind of like what you might see in some resumes. It's an attestation to someone's, you know, moral virtue or how hard working they are. But to get one from Benjamin Franklin at the time was akin to getting one from Elon Musk today or Bill Gates, someone of incredible stature and experience and repute. Um, it, it really was incredible. But he just happened to meet Franklin because he networked well in England. Um, he had decided to kind of start anew and go to America. We don't know much more than that as to the reasons why. But his first wife, um, th she died in childbirth along with their child, and his second marriage ended in a legal separation. So I think that Payne was trying to start anew. So there's Payne the tax collector. What about Payne the abolitionist? Now this is an area of Payne's life that is almost never covered, I think, in most of the, the mainstream summaries you see about Payne in his life. But throughout his life, he was a devout abolitionist. And let me tell you, in Payne's time, there was nothing more extreme than being an abolitionist. It was about the most niche position you could hold, the idea that slavery was morally evil. There were people that held that, but it wasn't 
you know, widely disseminated in the presses. Those ideas weren't widely debated. Um, but Paine was one of those people who was a pioneer when it came to this. And I'll, I'll detail three incidents which, which show this. So shortly after Paine came to America, he became editor of the Pennsylvania Magazine. This was one of the leading, what we would call patriot-leaning magazines in Philadelphia. And by patriot, I'm also going to use the word Whig interchangeably. But this shouldn't be always confused with like the Whig party or British Whig in some ways. But um, he was a patriot. He wrote in the Whig style. He was generally a supporter of the colonies in opposition to the laws of Britain that they were complaining about. But one essay in particular shows that Paine was an abolitionist. It was called African Slavery in America. Now this, this pamphlet in no uncertain terms that he chose to publish condemns slavery as a quote, outrage against humanity and justice that was practiced only by quote unquote pretended Christians. So the writer un unambiguously con condemned it as an affront to God. Um, so, continuing on that, he said that slavery has been pursued in the opposition of the Redeemer's cause. So he was really hard on slavery. He proposed that slavery should be immediately ended and the foreign slave trade should be ended. And again, there was nothing more extreme than to think of someone writing this and publishing it. That pamphlet was really the first abolitionist tract that most American historians look at. Now, there is some contention over wh whether Paine himself actually wrote it or not, and I tend to think he didn't because the style didn't align. But what matters is he practiced an immense amount of editorial discretion regardless to publish that. Um, so I think that's um, really important. Uh, the second thing is he became one of the first members of the Philadelphia Abolition Society, which was created by Benjamin Franklin, um, a group of American abolitionists that centered in Philadelphia, which was, you know, one of the only hotbeds of the idea in, in the country. Um, the ideas that that institution created were tangible. In fact, in five states, um, during the course of the American Revolution, five states adopted gradual manumission laws. Um, those laws were where a state decides to choose a certain date in the future and then all uh, would-be slaves that would be born after that date would be liberated. So those manumission acts, and Paine had a hand in influencing the one in Pennsylvania, were undoubtedly inspired by some of the things that he thought about slavery. And I just think that's so interesting. The third thing about his abolitionist streak, I will say, is that, um, we'll discuss this later, but Paine as a Francophile, some that generally favored France, in terms of the political situation of the day where everything was either, you know, do we want to do what England is doing or do we want to do what France is doing? He chose the latter in almost every regard. But one of the things that he really condemned the French Republican government of, and he was actually a part of it for a while, is for engaging in a revolution in Saint Domingo, which later grew into the Haitian Revolution. Um, people were saying, you know, we need to send French military forces there to suppress this slave uprising. The native uh, people there are rising up and uh, trying to kind of govern themselves and throw off their, their imperial colonial occupants. And Paine, breaking from his love of France, said, this is just a natural reaction to the bondage in which these people have been placed through humanity. He believed that it was wrong everywhere. And that's a, a strain of thought that goes through Paine that we'll touch upon again, his universalism. He thought if something was wrong or something was evil, it's evil wherever practiced. And all people had the right of um, the same rights, the same natural rights that he respected in, in America. So now we're gonna drift into common sense because that's a, the thing that Americans know most about him. Paine was the writer of common sense. Now common sense was originally going to be called plain truth. Um, another kind of snappy, concise, simplistic title. But the patriot Dr. Benjamin Rush, who will come up again perhaps, um, urged him to call it common sense. He helped him arrange a publisher to take this up. He, the publisher was also a radical Whig, someone that really um, supported the American uh, condemnation of parliament and especially the intolerable acts, 
and all the, the grievances that colonists had toward England at that time. Um, it was written in a matter of a few weeks at the end of 1775. So I want to put this in context. At the time, many people were pointing to what was happening up in Massachusetts, the battles of Lexington and Concord, as, you know, this is just some obscure, niche, isolated rebellion that will kind of go down in history of, you know, as an obscure event. We can't indulge in this or support it in any way because we'd be traitors against Britain. There should be a reconciliation with the mother country. Um, one person of note in the Continental Congress that espoused this was a guy named Joseph Galloway. You can actually read his pamphlet, the Tory argument against the American Revolution, um, that, that claims this. And the Continental Congress, despite deciding to actually invade Quebec, actually drafted a letter called the Olive Branch Petition. And I don't know if you, you all have read about this, but this was a concerted effort to assert the legitimacy of the King of England and say, hey, you know, this is the reason that, that the colonists took up arms in Massachusetts. We still acknowledge the King as the legitimate ruler over the empire and the colonies, and we are his subjects loyally. So there was movement politically to try to resolve this thing before it would be a war. But Payne said no. Payne said there's no way we can allow that. And he did it for several reasons. I'll just read through some of the ones that I've captured. One, that many traditional rights were naturally bestowed and pre-existed government. Even the English government, he said. So even traditional English rights like the right to bear arms, the right to um, be taxed only by the representatives of the people, the right to um, due process, even those rights, those are naturally bestowed. And as a Lockean, a follower of John Locke, he believed that government's sole purpose was to protect those rights, was to protect life, liberty, and property. Two, Payne thought that legitimate government depends on the consent of the governed, also to Jefferson later, and that governmental establishments were based on contractual relationships between individuals. So he said, as um, similar to Locke in the original kind of social compact theory that Locke fleshed out is that people originally got together, created a contract, and the result of that contract was government. So they would kind of delegate certain powers to government that weren't convenient to be held by individuals, like the power to uh, commence war, regulate foreign trade, things like that. Number three, Payne said that the incendiary British policy toward the colonies violated the colonial charters and the British constitutional system itself. So the British had engaged in tyranny, and particularly Parliament, he thought that. And Payne brought this fact over and up over and over and over. There was a particular law that Parliament passed that he had particular disdain for, and that was the Declaratory Act. Now, the Declaratory Act doesn't come up that much compared to some of the other contentious laws at the time, the Stamp Act, the Tea Act, the Intolerable Acts. They called them the Co Coercive Acts. But the Declaratory Act really kind of was a philosophical thorn in Payne's side. And here's why. What that act was, it was passed on the very next act after Parliament rescinded the Stamp Act. There was a Stamp Act nullification campaign in which colonists refused to allow these stamp collectors, stamp tax collectors, to distribute the paper for that in North America. Um, eventually, actually, English merchants were like, yeah, this thing has to be repealed. Not only do the Americans not want this thing, um, our merchants are never going to be able to profit as long as this act tries to be enforced. What they did was repeal that, but then the next act that Parliament did in 1766 was pass the Declaratory Act. What this act says was the colonies are bound in all cases whatsoever to parliamentary law. Now this Payne could not accept because Payne thought that the only thing really uniting the colonies and the British monarchy was the king. And actually, the deference that England had given these colonies had led to uh, the colonial legislatures, um, the, the House of Burgesses in, in, in uh, Virginia, the Colonial Assembly in New York. And those, those institutions were dissolved. One of the things that the Boston Port Act did in response to the Intolerable Acts was replace one of the houses of Massachusetts colonial government with a house that was only, import, uh, I'm sorry, only appointed by people from the, from the Crown. The Crown would do the appointments rather than having elections for it. 
Payne could not accept this. Payne thought that this was a form of slavery. That how should we be bound by th these people ruling from so far off? Six, and this is maybe one of my favorite, is that the British royal line derived from a bastard foreigner who gained power only through military prowess and a successful invasion of the English Isles in 1066, that being William the Conqueror. So he said that Britain has no more right to govern the American colonies as France has a right to govern Britain. He's saying essentially, like if, if you take Br some of the British Tory arguments against us to the limit, you're, you're talking about that British should, the Britain should be governed by France, a Norman kingdom. Um, seven, he said that a free people could withdraw from an illegitimate government, such as government, I'm sorry, could withdraw from such a government because such a government lacked the legitimacy to compel compliance. So just like Locke, he is saying that whenever government becomes destructive and, and ceases to protect the public happiness, ceases to protect life, liberty, and property, the people have a right to alter or abolish it. Now, that was an extreme opinion back then. It's actually an extreme opinion today in many circles. But Paine believed it. Just like Locke, just like Jefferson, just like Sidney, Paine believed that strongly. And that actually is fleshed out in the rights of man too. And lastly, that, um, that the American states should set up Republican governments with written constitutions and enact a continental charter. That's what he called it. But this is Paine basically calling for the constitution and germ. Paine is saying, unlike the British system, that their constitution was essentially you know, a series of traditions and acts and indictments of the king and uh, customs, traditions. We have to have a written constitution, thought Paine. And really, that's the American experience, as there's written constitutions here. But even that was a radical idea at that point, just to have a written constitution, much like a contract between individuals would be. How about Thomas Paine, the first American whistleblower? So in my book, I compared Paine to Edward Snowden, actually. So there is one interesting incident of Paine's life where he became a total pariah to the political class, even just years after having written the biggest blockbuster that America had ever seen. And Common Sense was that. Um, Paine at one point claimed that it had sold 500,000 copies. I don't think it sold that many. But it's very plausible that it sold a few hundred thousand copies. Um, and just to put this into perspective, there are about 2.5 million American colonists at the time that would have had the opportunity to buy it. So this was truly a blockbuster. Whether it was really one in six people that had it, I just, I, I don't think that there's much substantiation to that, but we don't really know. It's hard to get the figures, but either way, this propelled pain to stardom. But um, because Paine was propelled to stardom and actually had made a name for himself, he actually took on the moniker Common Sense too. So he would refer to himself as Common Sense, he would sign documents, Common Sense, etc. One of the things he got, well he got property in New Rochelle, New York. The New York government gave him a house there. It still stands today. The Thomas Paine uh, Cottage Museum. It's fantastic. I've never been there. I need to go there. Um, has anyone been there that's in this class? Been there? Thomas Paine Cottage Museum. Got to go there, New Rochelle, New York. But the other thing that he got in return for his services to the revolution, because everyone viewed him as instrumental, was a place as secretary on the Committee of Foreign Affairs. So he became secretary for perhaps the most important congressional committee. It dealt with um, uh, diplomatic negotiations, especially with France, but with all countries um, at the time. So because of this, he became privy to certain information that was dictating America's foreign policy at the time. Um, has anyone heard about the Dean Affair before? Has anyone heard that term? Well, he gave, became embroiled in a controversy called the Dean Affair because what happened there was in the years before America and France had an official alliance during the American Revolution, um, France was actually supporting America kind of clandestinely, secret, secretly. They actually set up a front company in France ran by a merchant named Beaumarchais, a very influential person at the time, very sympathetic of the patriot cause, to funnel money and arms to the American patriots even when there wasn't an official alliance. Now this, if the, if the cover got blown on this, that would have been, you know, uh, very contentious because what happened was, and it did, 
Because what happened was people accused Payne of speaking of financial impropriety that was transpiring. Because what happened was an American diplomat named Silas Dean went over there and he was a merchant and it turns out that he had been skimming off of the money given to American patriots during the whole course of this thing. And Payne believing in virtue and wisdom and integrity and you know all, all the things that the classic Roman Republic was built upon or allegedly was built upon, he believed should be present in this new Republican government. So he was gonna blow the door off this corruption. He said Silas Dean is essentially you know, an enemy to the American people. He's ripping them off. He's fi financially profiting in war. He was the first American war profiteer. So Payne is writing these essays in the presses, and you'd think that, wow, you know, this guy is doing a public service to expose all this corruption. But actually, the Continental Congress was split, like, basically right in the half over whether he had engaged in impropriety by printing those things or not. And that's because they said that hey, this compromises our entire alliance with France. Because this is well known, what if the whole thing is over? What if the, uh, the revolution cannot be consummated? We cannot separate from Britain now because of this. It throws everything to the wayside. And there was a big debate on this in the presses and eventually Payne actually lost his spot by the narrowest margins. He lost his position as Secretary of the Committee of Foreign Affairs. Now, Payne's reputation suffered for a few years, but in just a matter of a few years, more information came out that really kind of substantiated the allegations against Silas Dean, and Silas Dean really became a, a bigger pariah than Payne. Even some of the people that had condemned Payne for printing these things about Silas Dean, like um, Governor Morris and Robert Morris, came around and said, uh, yeah, it turns out that that guy was really corrupt. <laughs> But that's Payne, the first American whistleblower. There's some parallels to Snowden there, not completely, but I think there's some. What about Payne, the bridge builder? So Payne, like you know, Jefferson, Franklin, was something of a polymath. He was a very um, astute intellectual that had skill sets that ventured into various territory beyond politics, beyond history, um, and one of them was as an engineer. Payne actually stood at the cutting edge of a new frontier in bridge building as an iron bridge builder. So at Payne's time, there was almost no iron bridges. It's not completely out of the time period, but there was essentially one permanent iron bridge that had been built in Europe in Payne's time. But barely anyone in the, the United States knew anything about it. But Payne, kind of intending to retire from politics to some extent, went into bridge building. So he designed an iron bridge based on the design that he saw in a spider web, according to his own account. So he designed an iron bridge that ha would have integrity beyond that of um, wooden bridges and other types of bridges that existed at the time and tried to attract financial support for it, all over Pennsylvania at first. And he more or less failed. Um, actually, very few people wanted to fund this pursuit, even... Um, some of the most landed Pennsylvanian gentry that had befriended Payne. They just didn't see it as feasible, even though Payne wanted to build one of these bridges around Philadelphia at the time. So Payne actually decided to leave the United States. He moved to Britain, and for the next years, so from the end of the 1780s and into, actually all the way up until 1802, Payne bounced first between Britain and France, and then he'd be in France from 1793 onward trying to do the same thing. He was trying to attract financial funding for his bridge. Now Payne's designs were interesting and they even attracted the praise of Thomas Jefferson who wrote that quote, the execution of the arch design far exceeds your expectations. And Jefferson even articulated his own list of su suggestions that might help improve it. I mean Jefferson was nothing if not really uh, an avid architectural uh, genius as well. Um, Eventually, Payne did get a financier named Thomas White in England. He built a model bridge, so it was a scale bridge. It would have been something like a 1 20th version of the bridge that was put up on the lawn of this pub in England. And uh, ironically, one of the people that helped <coughs> test it or just, just kind of walk over it, observe it, he'd have people come over, was a guy named Edmund Burke. And, <laughs> and I just think it's so funny because the two were friends at one time. But in terms of political philosophy, they couldn't have been more 
bitter enemies, as we'll uh, come across in a bit. But um, the bridge essentially never went anywhere. It didn't attract much of a kind of a <laughs> good impression from onlookers. It was never decided by anyone to build it as a permanent bridge anywhere. Um, I do think there are some designs that still stand that are influenced by Payne, but none were built by Payne directly. Um, what about Thomas Payne, the execution escape artist? Now, like I said earlier, Payne had an uncanny knack for escaping early deaths. Um, in two of those cases, I think that are most pertinent to this class I want to go over, but there were so many. The first is that through the choice of writing The Rights of Man Part Two, Payne basically was <laughs> going to be executed for that. And the reason for that is that The Rights of Man, and we'll get into more of the ideas behind The Rights of Man later, but The Rights of Man Part Two, among other things, called for the utter dissolution of the English monarchy. Payne actually overtly called for the government to be overthrown. Now, in England, under the common law, this was seditious libel. And the only penalty for seditious libel was death. So actually, the government of William Pitt the Younger engaged in a massive censorship campaign, not only against the rights of man part two, although that was the principal target. It was other Whig patriot agitators in Britain that had called for a similar thing. They favored republicanism over monarchy. And again, the, the sheer radical nature of this cannot be understated. This was, you know, the most radical belief you could have. And just think of that. For just publishing that, for just saying that the, go the existing government is illegitimate and should re be replaced with another one. He didn't even say that it should be done so violently. He was charged with seditious libel. Now what happened was the rights of man sold so many copies and made Payne such a celebrity that he was welcomed in France by the region of Calais to serve as a representative delegate in their new representative Republican government. Um, haven't really touched on the French Revolution yet, but they had established a new French provisional uh, convention whose sole task, or primary task I should say, was to drop a new Republican system for France, post-monarchy. And he, again, he was a superstar there. Payne's book skyrocketed him to immense success such that he became a celebrity, not unlike a movie star that we would see today. He was treated like, you know, Brad Pitt would be, or some big star like that, for influencing so, so many things there. So he had escaped to France in time to be saved from execution in England. He was actually tried in absentia in London. Um, he had a famous lawyer named Thomas Erskine that kind of defended him in a very public trial, but the jury was very much unaligned with Payne's arguments and very much in the pro-Tory kind of anti-Payne vein. And because of that, he was charged with seditious libel and sentenced to death. So if Payne ever would have returned to his native England, he would have been put to death. But also in France, Payne also got caught up in the reign of terror in France. And it's crazy how he did, because no one was a bigger supporter of the French Revolution than Payne. We'll talk about that in a bit too. But what happened was one of the things that Payne did was he pled for the life of King Louis XVI. There was a big debate over what to do with the king. If you depose the monarch of a government that st stood for centuries, what do you do with them? Well, the Jacobins and especially Maximilien Robespierre and uh, St. Just and some of the other leading Jacobin voices said, for the nation to live, the king must die. They thought that this was he couldn't be allowed to live for symbolic purposes. It would give, you know, royalists a rallying point um, to institute a new monarchical government. But Payne said, actually, you know, I'm, I'm the most avid anti-monarchical person in the world, actually, but the Republican kind of disposition and Republican virtue necessitates allowing this king to live. Put him in exile to the United States because he thought that this was a, a critical, really time-intensive opportunity for Republicans at the time to show that we weren't just the same brutish, warlike monarchists that had ruled Europe that whole time. This was an opportunity to show this is a different system based on virtue and not force. 
let Louis live out his days. In fact, Paine thought that the issue with monarchy, or France's monarchy in particular, was systemic. It was the system that was the problem. It wasn't the actual king. The king actually, he thought, Louis XVI was actually a relatively good monarch. After all, he had supported the Americans during the American Revolution, militarily and financially, and had actually bankrupted the country and led in some ways to the French Revolution. So for that, after the Jacobins had taken power in a coup, they overthrew the existing Republican establishment there, they created a committee on public safety. It was essentially an oligarchy. And from there, they had designed a scheme in which all counter-revolutionaries would be quickly tried and executed. I think this ended in the, the mass executions of, I believe, about 50,000 people, although I think that sometimes those figures are debated. And one of the figures targeted in that was Paine. Because Robespierre, there's notes that Robespierre in his writing left behind that said, you know, this guy has to essentially be put away because of his pleading for the life of King Louis XVI, who was eventually killed, by the way. So Paine was actually apprehended, placed in prison during the, what's called the Reign of Terror in a place called Luxembourg Palace. And for eight months, he languished there. Um, he suffered, he couldn't write much of his time there, and he nearly died of an illness that basically incapacitated him for about a week. But he did escape execution there, and it's really an incredible story, but both Payne's account and his good friend account, Thomas Cleo Rick Rickman, corroborates this, is that one night, Payne was designated to be executed the next day, and a jailer would go around to all the different cells, marking an actual X on the door of the person um, who would, should be collected the next morning and executed. Now, if there isn't something more ghastly than that, I don't know what it is. But for whatever reason, we know that that detail crew went around the Luxembourg prison doors and for whatever reason marked Payne's door on the wrong side with an X on the wrong side. And not seeing that the next morning, the, the jailer did not pick Payne up. He was not led to the gallows or the people's razor. Uh, he was not executed by the guillotine. Um, and he escaped and survived the critical last few weeks for James Monroe, the uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs to France, to press for his citizenship. And why did he press for his citizenship? Well, based upon the fact that Payne had American citizenship, he was eventually allowed to leave. Now, Payne seriously broke and created a schism with Washington over this whole ordeal. Now, Payne and Washington were very close friends. They had met in the Continental Army. Payne spent some time in the Continental Army as an aide de camp to Nathaniel Green, but had befriended George Washington. Um, I, I, John Adams, who didn't like Payne, basically one time said, without the pen of Payne, the sword of Washington would have been raised in vain. Uh, many people believe that both of those men were so integral to this cause of independence, and they had remained friends. Actually, Payne dedicated version one of the rights of man to George Washington and he had a key from the Bastille sent to George Washington um, in thanks and in hopeful concord to attract uh, Washington's support for the French Revolution which was never received by the way. Um, but this is where the schism between those two developed because Washington was president at the time in which Payne was languishing in prison and Washington's subordinate Governor Morris the minister to France before being relieved by Monroe did not press for him to be released, did not press for his citizenship, even though Payne repeatedly wrote Morris and asked for this. In fact, at one point you can tell from Governor Morris's private writings, and Morris was an, another avid Federalist, is that not only would he not try very hard to press for Payne's American citizenship, he almost seemed to revel in the fact that Payne would be punished. So Payne took this extremely personally, but it's not quite clear to historians how much Washington actually knew about Payne's um, immediate condition. There's been a lot of speculation on that. Um, Payne eventually wrote a scathing letter that essentially called Washington full of ambition and avarice and someone that posterity would forget. Um, <laughs> that's really not uh, one of Payne's most uh, recognizable achievements by any stretch because there's no one more popular in the United States in this time than Washington. 
Um, but that's how that happened. There's many other ways in which Payne escaped a near death, but one just fun way that I'll, I'll leave off with before the next subject is to tell about an execution attempt on Payne's life once he had come back to America. Now Payne came back to America in 1802. He lived mostly on his New Rochelle property in New York during that time. And this attempt on his life happened during that time. And I believe it was the Christmas of 1805, an enraged former tenant named Christopher Derrick. He was a guy that rented Payne's property during part of his time in France, um, et cetera. They developed an argument over unpaid um, fence repairs or something crazy like that, right? So one night, Christopher Derrick goes out and goes on a rum binge and just drinks rum repeatedly and shows up to the back door of Payne's house, loads his musket, and takes a shot right at Payne sitting on the inside of his house. Now, thankfully for Payne, the shot missed. But what's incredible about this is Payne decided not to press charges on this man. <laughs> and I just, it's so unfathomable to think about this now. But uh, Payne was such a pariah and outcast, particularly for his letter against Washington, but also for um, his religious beliefs. Um, because of those two things, he had kind of been an outcast, and he didn't want to soil his reputation more, perhaps, in his community by pressing charges on a guy who clearly did this under the influence of alcohol and would not have done so otherwise. But just a crazy story about that. There's four other cases that I think that he nearly met a early death that I articulate in the book. Thomas Paine and the English Invasion. Now, after this subject, we'll get into the rights of man, but Thomas Paine and the English Invasion. So after being sentenced to execution in absentia, meaning that he could never return, if he did set foot on England, he'd be arrested and executed, Paine went to France. And after he had gotten out of Luxembourg prison, and that's he spent several more years in France. He was actually, his position was restored in the French legislature for a time. But one of the things that he conceived of was a military scheme to invade his native country of England. And at the time, a young, very charismatic Corsican um, commander named Napoleon Bonaparte was rising up through the ranks of France, the military establishment. He had made a name at the Siege of Toulon. He had um, essentially endeavored to rule the country eventually through a military-style dictatorship and consolidated power through a coup called the Coup of 18 Brumaire, named after one of the French calendars. But Payne befriended Napoleon for a time, believe it or not. It's just it's such a crazy story that perhaps two of the most influential people of their time that you wouldn't necessarily know about meeting did meet. And Napoleon, at first, gushed praises upon Payne. He famously said, not only did he sleep with a copy of the rights of man underneath his pillow, but a golden statue should be created to Payne in every city in the world. <laughs> and that's just incredible praise. But what really attracted um, Napoleon to Payne was, firstly, the rights of man, which he said he loved. It was the best definitive pro-Republican treatise ever written, but also for Payne's scheme, which came out in pamphlet form, to invade England. Now, during the Napoleonic era, Napoleon entertained the potential of invading England at least twice in two major times, and one of them was as a result of Payne's plan. Payne had proposed that instead of traditional naval warfare, which would be waged by big, massive, what were called ships of the line, that France should develop a huge fleet of small gunboats about a thousand of them to take place in this, this proposed invasion, and each to be fitted with a special um, cannon. But what happened here was Napoleon was really impressed by this scheme. It was daring, it was bold. Like Payne's political beliefs, it was really radical. It defied military convention in every way. He wanted to put it in place. So he said, Napoleon, why don't you come with me and let's have this, this conference with my top military commanders, and let's see if we can kind of get buy-in to this. He seemed to really be on board with this. Well, during that conference, it did transpire, and we're not exactly sure why, but what we know is that during that conference, Napoleon said, all right, Payne, go ahead, pitch your plan to all my men here. Payne abruptly said, you know what? Upon further reflection, I don't think this will work. I think we need to have a peace with Britain instead of an invasion. 
and we don't know why he did that abruptly. But from that point forward, he was persona non grata to Napoleon. And actually the feeling became mutual because once Napoleon kind of led the coup and assumed power and essentially became a military dictator over France, Payne had said he was, quote, the completest charlatan that ever lived. So no love lost between those two. All right. So let's talk about the rights of man. The rights of man, like I said earlier, is probably the most important classical liberal treatise of all time. It was written in response to Burke's reflections of the revolution in France, which you guys have already talked about. I know you guys have had a presentation on Burke. And the two were once friends, which makes this so, so interesting, I think, at least to me. But um, Paine had decided to retire from politics. He had only wanted to bridge build from then on. And actually, in the early stages of the French Revolution, um, Burke put out a few letters that seemed to actually make it, he, he almost seemed tacitly supportive of the revolution in France, or of the revolutionaries. But as time went on, it became clear that Burke was going to write a very anti-French Revolution pamphlet. And Burke's pamphlet actually, as you might know, was originally designed to a, as a letter to a noble that had asked his opinion on that. Um, but some of the things that Burke said was that these revolutionaries were basing all of their beliefs on these abstract principles that they cannot possibly understand. And they're really throwing what the classical conservative highest virtue was to the wayside, that being stability and inherited wisdom. What Burke said was that through the course of time in England and elsewhere, some ideas were allowed to continue and some ideas for being bad had died. And everyone living benefits from that. So what Burke was saying was that every kind of governmental system is kind of like a contract between the dead, the living, and those yet to be born. But Paine said, no, that's hogwash. What Paine said was that the earth belongs to the living and government is only fit and legitimate when the people consent to it, the people that are living. So some of the things that Burke said did come to pass, I have to admit that. He actually had prognosticated in Reflections on the Revolution in France that France would have eventually become a military dictatorship. I think he was right on with that. And I just articulated why. Napoleon seized power. And even before that, um, the Directory had been usurped by a military dictatorship even before Napoleon. But um, what Napoleon said was that constitutions are the way to impose a new order. And people have the right in every generation, whether they were part of the generation that, you know, the first generation, as some of the social compact theories talk about, or the current generation, they have a right to dispose of their government and replace it with a new one. Actually, Paine thought the, the very idea that a people could not alter or abolish their government was a form of slavery. He thought it was a form of slavery to those that had desired and designed a system that he wanted no part of, that was alien to him. Um, but the rights of man was so much more than that. Paine had said that despite Burke's call that this was just a bloody abstract revolution based on nothing more than abstract principles and that the people leading this were inept to lead, um, he said, well, the people have the right to do that regardless. And it's not really for us to decide how feasible it is. He thought that it was that generation in that part of the country's will to decide that. He also said that the bloodshed that had happened was not really much different than what had transpired even in native England where Burke resided. Because after all, if you read about the English Civil Wars, that period was drenched in incredible bloodshed, like unprecedented bloodshed in the middle, middle of the 17th century. Um, English fought a series of civil wars between the parliamentarians and the royalists, um, and it led to a short-lived Republican uh, Commonwealth first, then Protectorate. And that era was drowned in blood. And, you know, Paine said that's the natural course of things at some times. Paine also espoused his original, or I'm sorry, his universalist opinions. In The Rights of Man, he famously said, the world is my country, all mankind is my brethren, and my religion is to do good. And I think that nothing really shows who Paine was more than that phrase. Because it meant more than the fact that, you know, it was more than abstract. What he was saying was that these principles of liberty apply to everyone. So he couldn't imagine how someone as astute and patriotic 
and virtuous as Burke, who really sympathized with the American revolutionaries, you know, wouldn't also sympathize with Frenchmen in the same plight, fighting for self-government over landed noble monarchy. He just couldn't understand it. Um, the rights of man also did things like espouse that, you know, England should adopt written constitutions. And that was, you know, part of the American experience. But Paine had also suggested that religion and the state should be totally divorced in the rights of man. He pointed actually to examples in the United States saying, hey, look at Virginia. They completely divorced all connection between the Anglican church and the government. Now, people that want a government position don't have to swear test oaths. You know, your mind isn't cur it constantly under the threat of being controlled by others. Um, you know, so there, there's so many things in the rights of man that Paine espoused. And I'll say one more thing before I close out this period, but I will say that Paine's religious beliefs have also made him a total radical. Paine was a deist. He believed in a single creator, but had nothing but disdain for religious establishments. He doubted all the miraculous aspects of every religion, including Christianity, though, because Christianity was the most prevalent in his time, he attacked many of those things, including you know, the virgin conception of Jesus and all sorts of other things that were, were completely you know, heretical at the time. It's hard to make someone more of an outcast than to basically take issue with the basic tenets of the Bible during the Second Great Awakening, a time in which you know, religion was spreading like wildfire, especially in the United States. But Paine had thought that God's grace and God's... Um, immaculate nature could be seen in nature, in the environment, using reason. Um, Paine thought, you know, to, to treat his fellow creations well, treat fellow humans well, was the highest aspiration he could have. So he doubted all the prophecy, and he made many arguments that you see some of the new atheists today making, like Daniel Dennett or Sam Harris, or um, a lot of these people make. They say that, you know, the Bible is full of contradictions, um, some parts of the Bible were written long after some people think um, that all this prophecy was halluc like hallucinations and um, you know this doesn't withstand the scrutiny of reason. So that really made Paine a pariah. He articulated this in the, uh, the Age of Reason, which he initially planned to be three volume. It eventually became two volume and then there is some miscellaneous other religious writings. Um, this lost him friends with personal friends. Um, Samuel Adams actually once wrote him a note. It was just scathing. Samuel Adams was a Congregationalist Puritan um, who basically, uh, basically just said, what are you trying to do? You're trying to de-Christianize the United States. I can't find the quote, but if you read that correspondence bet between the two, it's actually quite interesting. And actually, Payne replies pretty cordially to Sam Adams, but check that out if you are, in, are interested. Benjamin Rush, the guy that helped him write Common Sense and helped him name it, he would not see Paine after Paine returned to America. Would not do it because of his religious beliefs. Um, the press had a field day with him. Now this is probably my favorite part because man, if you think the press is crooked in whatever direction today, just listen to this. This is my favorite. Um, the Baltimore Republican, or the Anti-Democrat at the time it was called, called Paine a loathsome reptile. Um, <laughs> Philadelphia's portfolio skewered him as a drunken atheist and the scavenger of action. Um, <laughs> another publication called him a lily-livered cynical rogue, a demi-human arc beast, and an, obj and an object of disgust, of abhorrence, of absolute loathing to every decent man except the President of the United States. <laughs> taking, <laughs> taking aim at both Payne and Jefferson. The two were friends throughout their lives, by the way. Um, the Gazette of the United States and the Daily Advertiser branded him the infamous scavenger of all the filth which could be raked from the dirty paths which have been hitherto trodden by all the revilers of Christianity. I, they just wrote better back then. This is, <laughs> I don't know, I think that's incredible. But he was a total pariah. But the last thing I want to leave you all on with Paine, if you take any single thing from the presentation today, it's that Paine's radical beliefs, much 
viewed as radical at the time as they were, are really just what we live through today. Whenever you look around and realize that people don't own other people, I think a part of pain is there. When you run, when you can be sure that you're, you will have a city council rather than a noble magistrate running your local government, I think Payne's influence is there too. And I think the fact that when you decide to run for office or decide to um, go to universities such as this, the fact that you don't have to uh, take an oath to a particular religious belief, I think Payne's influence is there too. When people call for national divorce, uh, for the, the you know, the opinion that, you know, our differences are too incompatible throughout the United States and we might have to break this thing up because this far off government in Washington isn't serving our needs anymore. I think a little piece of pain is there too. Even when it comes to the welfare state, it's, I didn't get into it much, but in the Rights of Man Part 2 at the very end, pain actually uh, promotes a vision for a welfare state in germ to some extent, something that had never been seen before. Progressive income tax, aid for the poor, aid for the elderly and even a proto-universal uh, basic income scheme in agrarian justice. I think pieces of pain are here, there as well. So if there's anything true, love him or hate him, Payne's influence is with us still today. He has mass appeal to basically everyone, um, whether you're on the left, right, conservative, liberal, libertarian, whether you're green, whatever political disposition you have, I think some people would you know, think there's some great things about pain but have problems with other things about pain. I'm no different. But if pain were here in front of me, I could shake his hand and congratulate him in a job well done because I think he did more good than harm. And this was felt even in his time. The last quote I want to share is by John Adams, who did not like pain. John Adams actually despised pain, but John Adams did say in one of his letters one time that no man had made more of an impact on his time than Thomas Paine. And then he said begrudgingly, call it then the age of pain. And I think there's something to be said for that. So that's where I'll leave you with Thomas Paine.